that was ever deified on planet Earth. And they made him the sun god, which ended up being Baal. The word Baal in your scriptures can be traced back to Nimrod. So it's an interesting uh, reality of history when you see Baal and Ashtaroth, you're ending up coming all the way back to this story of Nimrod and Semiramis. And so Baal is now ruling the universe as the sun god and somehow luck has it through the Babylonian legend that Semiramis gets pregnant by the rays of the sun of her deceased husband Nimrod. And she gives birth to a young baby boy named Tammuz. Semiramis, Nimrod's wife, insisted that Nimrod became the sun god. She cut Nimrod's dead body into pieces and sent them to each tribe of Babylon. People regarded the place where a part of Nimrod was buried as sacred. She also claimed that Nimrod was reincarnated as her son. As Semiramis ruled over Babylon in place of her young son Tammuz, she maneuvered people into worshiping her. Monuments of Semiramis carrying her child Tammuz in her arms were set up all over Babylon along with various images symbolizing the sun god. The sun worship and the mother-child worship, which was a scheme devised by Semiramis, put down roots as a religion of Babylon. Idolatry stemmed from Babylon spread to many countries after the Tower of Babel collapsed. It is because when the Babylonians were scattered over the whole world, they brought the sun worship and the mother-child worship. The sun worship and the mother-child worship were assimilated into the cultures and religions of many countries and they came to have various forms and names. Nimrod, the sun god, was known as Mithra in Persia, Sol in Rome, Ra or Horus in Egypt, and Apollo in Greece. Semiramis and Tammuz, who were the start of the mother-child worship, was called Isis and Horus, Venus and Dionysus, Diana and Attis, and Astaroth and Tammuz, respectively. Besides these, the image of Goddess, who is holding a baby in her arms, was venerated in many countries of the world. If so, was the mother-child worship the creature of an age, which was especially welcomed only in Babylon? Surprisingly, the mother-child worship of Babylon has been passed down through the thousands of years and still exists today. In Vatican of Rome, we can find the mother-child worship in its original state. Now, further down in the story, as Tammuz grows and becomes a man, Tammuz actually marries his mother and they have a very uh, sexual relationship. And that baby Tammuz and his mother Semiramis is where you get the story of Cupid. Cupid, it, during Valentine's Day, is how the story of Valentine's Day developed was from uh, Tammuz who married a, a very uh, unbiblical relationship uh, with his mother. Okay, back to the story of Tammuz. So Tammuz, for 40 years, was a tremendous hunter, and he took the place of his father, ruling the world, and had tremendous power. But more than anything, he was a credible hunter. But unfortunately, his gift and his skill of hunting caught up with him one day because he was killed during his 40th year by a wild boar. Every spring, uh, the first Sunday after the vernal equinox, the spring equinox, they have what was called Ishtar's, uh, Ishtar's Sunday. And they would have a sunrise service. At the sunrise service, the priest of Ishtar uh, would impregnate young virgins on the altar. And during that same service, they would take the babies that were now three month old from the previous year, and they would sacrifice those children on the altar to Ishtar. And then they would take the eggs of Ishtar and they would dip those eggs in the blood 
of those young infants. And that is where we get sunrise services, and uh, that is potentially where we get the dying of Easter eggs. It is also interesting to note that worldwide universal color of Easter eggs is red. Even the White House, the official color of the White House Easter egg is ruby red. Now, back to Tammuz. Tammuz gets killed by a wild boar. So every year in commemoration of celebrating the death and the deification of Tammuz, which became the son of God, the son of his father, they would set aside 40 days prior to Easter in, and they would fast and they would pray and they would have a giant feast on Easter Sunday where they would celebrate the, the death and the resurrection of Tammuz. And guess what they would have for dinner on that Sunday evening? You got it, Easter ham. They would kill a boar in commemoration to Tammuz who was killed by a wild boar. And yes, the 40 days prior to Easter, uh, we call it Lent, or the Catholics call it Lent. That 40 days did not come from, my friends, the 40 days of Jesus in the wilderness. That 40 days was already in place for thousands of years before Jesus even showed up. It comes from the 40 days of fasting and praying for Tammuz before they celebrated Easter. I'm going to give you some of the names and, and what they're most commonly uh, remembered for in these different cultures and some of you will recognize them immediately. First of all, in Egypt they were known as Isis and Osiris. In Phoenicia they were recognized as Asheroth and Baal, the very same Asheroth and Baal that you see in the scriptures. In Greece they were Aphrodite and Adonis or Eros, where we get the word erotic from. And in Rome, they were called Venus and Cupid. That's right, that's where we get Valentine's Day from and Cupid. Even in the Far East, listen to this, this is amazing, Cupid was known as Zoroaster. Zoroaster is made up of two words, Zoro, which means seed of, and Asheroth, which is Easter. And so what Cupid actually means in the Far East is the seed of Easter, or the seed of his mother, Tammuz and his mother, Semiramis. If you look on your screen, you're going to see Isis and Osiris, or this is Ishtar and Tammuz. Now, some of you may be uh, asking, well, wait a minute, uh, I celebrate Easter, you're talking about Ishtar. Easter is actually the Anglicization of the word Ishtar. In other words, if you say Ishtar in English, it's pronounced Easter. That's how the etymology of that word evolved over time. What I want you to see is I want you to see what's on her head is a crescent moon, and in the center of that crescent moon is the actual sun itself. And so the symbol of power of uh, Isis, or Ishtar, was the crescent moon holding the sun itself, her deceased husband, Baal, the sun god. And you can see the baby there that is nursing from her breast. Ishtar was known as the goddess of the east, the bare-breasted fertility god of the east, or the sunrise, which is why they had the service at sunrise on Easter morning. Here on your screen you see a pagan carving of the solar deity Baal Hadad depicted as a disc in a crescent. Okay, You can see the, the half-moon disc there in the center of your screen with the, with the sun that is cradled inside of it. And that is the sun god as well as the, as the crescent moon that, it, that surrounds it. Now as you see that the main symbol for the sun god was the crescent moon with the sun on the top of it or centered and cradled inside that crescent moon, we now move to something that's a bit controversial but very true historically is the Catholic Eucharist is actually the sun that is inside of that crescent moon. I'm going to show you some pictures of the actual Eucharist in different positions and you're going to see that not only is it similar, it's identical. This is where they got the symbols from. You can see here, this is a particular object that holds uh, the Eucharist and I found this online and this is what the quote said. I left off the particular church for obvious reasons but this was their advertisement for a particular Friday. It says, Eucharistic adoration is held on the first Friday of every month for the purpose of honoring and praying to the Blessed Sacrament. Now, I don't know about you, but my Bible says to pray to the Father, our Father. 
Yeshua, Jesus, said to pray to the Father. He did not say to pray to inanimate objects, whether they represent him or not. Now, look very carefully at, on the right-hand side, you can see the moon, the crescent moon shaped, holding that sun or that wafer of bread. Here's a close-up of it right here. The crescent moon cradle with the sun-shaped monstrance of the Roman Catholic Church. Now you'll see that it's actually the rays of the sun go all the way around this. They didn't hide it at all. Why did they not hide it? Because this is thousands of year old. This comes right out of paganism and sun god worship where it was the symbol of Baal and his wife Ishtar. And right here you can see the pine cone staff is another symbol found in paganism that's connected with the sun god uh, coming out of Egypt, Osiris. It's kind of in a form of a pitchfork, you can see, where the pine cone is in the center. Now, why did they choose a pine cone? Because a pine cone represents... Pine cone symbolism, another um, very popular piece of symbolism for people who consider themselves, quote, in the know that they consider that they are spiritually aware and enlightened, they have the knowledge, they are awoke, and they have wisdom, and they have transformed themselves spiritually. In many cases, it's the exact opposite. Uh, the, pine, the pine cone symbolism comes after the pineal gland, which is at the center of the head. It's uh, right here, circled in red. Um, it's considered in the midbrain or the limbic system of the brain. Um, it regulates, uh, this gland regulates a lot of different functions within the individual related to perception, emotion, etc. And the gland looks like a little pine cone. It has uh, a lot of blood flow that goes through it and it's very much attacked as something that they don't, they seem not to want to develop or function properly. So a lot of the food, things in water uh, are very much attacked to target this part of the central nervous system. Uh, the pine cone literally looks like a little pineal gland. Okay, the pineal gland looks like a little pine cone, I should say. This is called the court of the pine cone, and it is at the Vatican. That's where that pine cone is at. It is surrounded by two peacocks. Peacocks are another big symbol in alchemy. They represent alchemical transformation. Again, the pine cone represents awakening, resurrection or transmutation, spiritual transmutation. Now below it, there is a black empty sarcophagus right down there below on the left hand side. Uh, as you go up these steps in the port of the pine cone to the other side of it from this image perspective, that's what you will see. And behind it, there is an empty sarcophagus. Now they're basically throwing this symbolism right in your face. You know, we are the resurrected ones. We are the ones who have come out of darkness and into light. We have the knowledge. We understand how the awakening process works. We understand how this um, activity of the brain that people don't even understand and whose functions are essentially shut down due to the horrible nutrition and all kinds of pollutants in their food and water. We know how that works. You know, and we have, we have done that transformation to ourselves, but that's not for you. You know, we're going to sequester that and keep it to ourselves and keep it here. And they never mention this. You'll never hear about this by the Vatican. But just go on Google Images and, you know, you'll see tons of images of the type Court of the pine cone. You have a lot of tourist images that just take pictures of it. Of course, here you see the Pope in his uh, astrotheological regalia here. The fish head mitres that they wear mm -hmm. are the representative of the fish head mitres that were worn by the Sumerian priests and the priests of Babylon. The Abgal. Yes. That's they, right. Yes. They, ser and they served in the, in the temple of uh, a, a goddess named Nanshi. Yes, and it specifically references um, uh, what, what, what we, who we know as Dagon. Yes. Um, so, and he was known as Oannes to the Greeks. Yeah. And uh, this was according to myth, an individual, a, a, a hybrid person, a half fish, half man thing that came out of the sea mm -hmm. and began to instruct mankind in the lost knowledge. But at the base of it is the pine cone right there in his hand. I circle it right there. In symbolic iconography throughout the ancient world, the pine cone is revered. It's always a symbol of the transformation of a god 
often the God is giving that spiritual essence or knowledge to humanity. Here you see it in the Akkadian tradition of one of their gods, a clearly non-human looking entity. Here it is in the Babylonian tradition. Because this staff goes all the way back to ancient sun god worship where it represented power and authority of the gods, you see. And this is a close-up of that staff right here where the pine cone is embedded right in the staff itself. Let's move on to another symbol. This is the symbol of the trident. The trident is a, a, the devil's pitchfork. It really is a symbol of Satan, of the horns of Satan. It's an ancient satanic and pagan hand gesture called the trident. We find this in archaeology all over the place. Whenever you get into any kind of society of sun god worship, you find the trident everywhere. You see it in ancient Babylon. It was placed in the hands of all the pagan sun gods. All the pagan gods and pharaohs had some sort of trident, a staff, that they would be connected to power and authority of the gods. The most famous one, of course, is Neptune's trident. We call it the devil's pitchfork, and that's where it comes from. It's just not a drawing that someone made up. This has history built into it of where these things come from. Now, if you move forward in time, uh, or, or during the same time period, excuse me, you're going to find another symbol that is even more important. As a matter of fact, you're going to see two symbols in this picture. This is a pagan statue of Jupiter that has been renamed St. Peter. You also see what is baby Jesus, supposed to be baby Jesus, is none other than baby Tammuz. And how do we know it's not Jesus? Because you see trident all over the place. You see the trident symbol in the hand of the infant Jesus, along with the tridents coming out of the statue's head. You'll see three tridents, two coming off the sides of the head and one coming off the top of the head. This is not baby Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. This is a pagan sun god, Tammuz, from the story of Baal, Nimrod, and Semiramis ended up being Cupid in today's Valentine's Day. And right here is the ancient Babylonian altar for the sun god Baal, and its main symbol is the eight-pointed star, which can be depicted as two four-point stars built inside of one another as the solar wheel. We see the same solar wheel sunburst over a Buddhist temple in Thailand. Here is a monastery uh, St. Ignatius, where the solar wheel or sunburst is depicted in the floor tiles. Here is the face of a child, which is of course Tammuz, within the fertility symbol of the sun's rays on a Roman Catholic altar. The same exact symbol, a child, which is of course Tammuz, within the fertility symbol of the sun's rays on a Roman Catholic altar. The same exact symbol is shown uh, in a face of the Babylonian sun god on a pulpit in a Roman Catholic church in Scandinavia. Okay, all this same symbol comes right out of paganism as I've shown. Okay, this is probably one of the most fascinating pictures that I have. Uh, I zoomed in to the Vatican using Google Earth and stopped several miles above and, and look what we discovered is this is the largest solar wheel on Earth. This is the court of St. Peter at the Vatican in Rome itself. Excuse me, the sun disk behind the head of this Roman Catholic statue in Westminster Ca uh, Cathedral in London. Where did they get the idea of sun disks behind these saints? Uh, it's because this was what was found on J behind the head of Jupiter and all these sun gods uh, was the actual uh, monstrance of the, of the Roman Catholic Church. That, that halo is not a halo, that is a sun disk. And they borrowed it from paganism. We see here behind Krishna another sun disk behind his head. And this is just to show that it doesn't just happen in Catholicism, that the sun disk predates Catholicism by hundreds, even thousands of years. It was borrowed. We see it in stained glass windows behind all of the Roman Catholic saints, even Mary. And if you look carefully, you see the sacred heart, that sacred heart, even though I don't have time to go into this, even the sacred heart comes right out of paganism. That exact same symbol with the sun disk behind the sacred heart has to do with Baal and Tammuz, the sun gods. And you can see it all over the Roman Catholic Church, and even in other pagan religions across the world. And where do we find this eight-pointed star, this solar wheel, this sun disk today? None other than on top of our Christmas trees. Now, I know all of us have been taught that the star on top of the Christmas tree represents the star of Bethlehem 
that the kings came in to find baby Jesus. But unfortunately, the star of the ancient pagan sun gods predates the star of the Christmas tree, the star of Bethlehem, by over a thousand years. They were taking the sunburst and connecting it to what you're going to learn in just a few minutes is the tree of Nimrod. And that is where we get our Christmas tree from and the star that we put on top. If you look carefully, you can see there is a tremendous significance and a similarity between the sunburst and the star that we put up there today. Here's the sun disk proudly displayed on top of Christmas trees in, in a mall. Matter of fact, this one doesn't even hide the fact that it's not a star, it's the sun that you're looking at. Even the eight-pointed star on top of the White House Christmas tree for everyone to see is the same eight-point star that you, we find in archaeology thousands of years ago connected to pagan sun god worship. When do you think the birthday of Nimrod and Tammuz was? On the first day of the year when the sun is reborn. And what day do you think that the sun is reborn? In the middle of winter, at the winter solstice, December 25th. That's right. That's where we get December 25th on Christmas Day where we say that Jesus was born. Why did we choose Jesus being born on December 25th? Where did that date come from? Very simple. Jesus was the Son of God. Tammuz was the son of the gods. He was the son of his father, Baal. And so the pagans, which early Christianity came right out of paganism in Rome, they were already worshiping the sun god on Sunday in Rome, which is where we get worshiping on Sunday from. All judges, city people, and craftsmen shall rest on the venerable day of the sun. Constantine's edict in 321 played an important role in making the sun god worship faith to put its roots down in the church. Many Bible believers today have followed tradition handed down by previous generations. They believe and were taught that Sunday is the proper day of worship. That the Savior changed the day of worship from the Jewish Sabbath to Sunday. The adoption of Sunday as the Christian Sabbath has little to do with the Bible and everything to do with Constantine the Great over 300 years after the Messiah's death. Constantine was emperor of the Roman Empire from 306 to 337 CE. He was a sun worshiper who on his deathbed converted to Christianity. In 321 CE, while still a sun worshiper, Constantine established Sunday as the day of worship. He decreed, on the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. In this coin circulated by Constantine in 317 CE, we see the face of Constantine on one side, and on the other the figure of Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun. The sun god was also known as Mithras, and his birth was on December 25th. This date was adopted as the birth of Christ, and became the date for Christmas many centuries later. Clearly Constantine was an avid worshiper of the sun god Sol Invictus. Amazingly, Martin Luther, the champion of the modern-day Protestant movement, said, They allege that the Sabbath changed into Sunday, the Lord's Day, contrary to the Decalogue as it appears. Neither is there any example more boasted of than the changing of the Sabbath day. Great say they, is the power and authority of the church, since it dispensed with one of the Ten Commandments. Nowhere in the Bible do we see that Yahshua and his apostles changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. In fact, the Messiah in his Sermon on the Mount has this end-time prophecy. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Those who were tainted with polytheism of Rome looked as if they had converted but in actuality, it wasn't easy for them to get rid of the religious rites and institutions of worshiping the sun, the moon, and the stars. Stop everything you're doing, because Raid Shadow Legends just released a new legendary champion, and you can get her for free. All you have to do is download Raid, log in for seven days, and you'll get dealt.
What if I told you that America has its own Stonehenge? These giant stones suddenly appeared on a hillside. What if I told what if I told you that America has its own Stonehenge? These giant stones suddenly appeared on a hillside outside of all places.